my phone though. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. But don't hesitate to ask any questions. I promise. Um, but if there's too much background noise, my brain gets all squirrely. So. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> all right. Okay. So let's talk about homeowners. Okay. So homeowners, the first thing we want to know is that if it is a even number, an even number, which means a two, a four, a six, or an eight, it is named peril, named peril. And if it is, and we'll talk about what all this means. If it is a odd number, like a one, oh, not a one, we don't have a one. Let me erase that. We do on dwelling, but not on homeowners. Like a three or a five, it is open peril. Okay, do you remember the difference between named and opened? Oh, I made you mute. Yes. So I'm gonna ask you a question, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> Open was everything except what is not yes. named. <laughs> yes, yeah, okay, you watch my other move. Yes, okay. All right, so open peril is anything not, um, it'll cover anything not excluded where named has to be listed. So if you have a named peril policy, if you have a two, a four, or a six, or eight, it'll say you're covered for fire, you're covered for lightning, you're covered for explosion, and it will name the things that you are covered for. And if it ain't named, it ain't covered. So if it ain't named, it ain't covered. An open peril policy, on the other hand, will say we will cover everything except what is listed here. So an open peril will actually list what is excluded. And, and we don't even want to use the word list when we talk about open peril. It'll, we want to think it covers everything not excluded. So it will list the exclusions, but we just say it as in they cover everything not excluded. So named peril policies will only cover what is named, fire, lightning, wind, hail. Open will cover anything not excluded. So as long as it's not listed as an exclusion, it's completely covered, which means that open peril is actually better. So an open peril policy is the best policy that you can have. It will cover anything not excluded. So if you have an even number, a two, a four, a six, an eight, you know it's named peril. If you have a three or a five, it is open peril. Now with homeowners, um, there's, there's coverages and then there's like policy type. And whatever policy type you have, it pretty much has all the same coverages. There are some like exclusions to that, like a, like a renter's policy isn't gonna cover the walls and the roof because you're just renting, but you don't have to worry too much about which type of policy comes with which coverages. You wanna kind of remember it as in, no matter what type, you pretty much have all the same coverages. You don't need to worry too hard about what is or isn't on each type. So first let's talk about the types. And what I mean by types is what type of homeowners do you need? So these are the types of homeowners. Oops, W, not an M. I, I sometimes spell really bad <laughs> when I'm talking. So just ignore that. All right, so types of homeowners. So the first one is if you have an H O two, three, or five. This is just gonna be for a regular house. Nothing weird or different. It's just the type, it's just that you're covering a house. It's not a condo, it's not a rental house. Um, it's just a regular house. Now the difference between a two, three, or five is how much coverage. How much coverage do you have? An HO2 is named broad. And it's gonna be like the basic homeowners, it's, it's the, the best named policy you can have. It's just, a, it's the broad form perils, all the regular perils that a homeowners is gonna cover is gonna be on an HO2. A three and a five is gonna be open, which means it's gonna be way more coverages. So what is the difference between a three and a five? Well, first of all, what's the name of a three? And a three is special. So that's the name. And this is something they could test you on. What is the name of an HO2? Broad. What is the name of an HO3? Special. What is the name of an HO5? Comprehensive. So we have a three and a five, which are both 
odd, they're both open. What is the difference between a three and a five? We're gonna talk a little bit of it later about the coverages. So this is the types of homeowners. And pretty soon we're gonna be, we're doing the coverages of homeowners. But you have coverage A, which is walls and roof. And we'll talk more about that later. And you have coverage C and there's B too, but mostly we're talking A and C right now. And then C, which is all your stuff inside, your clothes, your shoes, your furniture, your pots, your pants. Over here with a three and a five, on a three, coverage A is open. So that means the walls and the roof, if anything were to happen to the walls and the roof, it would be covered as long as it's not excluded. So the walls and the roof are open. Same it on a five. Coverage A is open on an HO5 as well. Here's the difference. On a three, coverage C is named and it will follow the broad form peril. On a five, coverage C is open. So a five is actually the best you can have because it's open, open. Not only are the walls and the roof open, but your stuff inside is covered for anything as long as it's not excluded, which brings um, a point um, under coverage C and an HO5, it's the only policy that offers mysterious disappearance. This is like, I don't know if I lost it. I don't know if it was stolen. I just can't find it. Like my other earring, I'm wearing one now because I can't find the other one. I'll eventually find it. But like, I don't know if it was stolen. If I lost it, where did it go? What happened? That's mysterious disappearance. And the only homeowner's policy that covers that is an HO5 because it's open on um, personal property. Coverage C is stuff. Personal property, clothes, shoes, furniture, pots, pans. So a five is open on that where a three is named. So a three is kind of like an in-between a two and a five. It's open on the walls and the roof, but it's named on the inside. The clothes, the shoes, the furniture, they will have to follow the broad form perils. So broad form is wharves, BBB ice golf. Not that you need to memorize those, but it's like all the named perils are on the broad form and your stuff inside would follow the broad form. Whereas on an HO5, it's open, open. Everything is open. Everything is covered unless it's excluded. Um, and that means that you do have the mysterious disappearance on the HO5. And if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep talking. Okay, so the next one is an HO4. And this is a renter's policy, sometimes called contents only. Because a renter's policy is only covering the actual stuff inside. So on an HO4, when we talk about coverages A, B, C, D, it actually starts at C. There is no A or B because a renter says you don't actually own the house. So you could be living in a condo, you could be living in a house, you could be living in a trailer and you would have an HO4 if you don't own the thing you're living in, but you are living in it, you are renting it. So a, a HO4 is gonna start covering all of your stuff and then the liability, but it doesn't have A or B, but you don't even need to, it's not like they even test you on that, but HO4 starts at coverage C, which again, we'll talk about coverages here in a minute. So HO4 is a renter's policy, contents only, your memory trick here is for rent. If it's for rent, you need an HO4. HO4 is renter's policy uh, for rent. And again, you don't have a walls and a roof because you're focused on contents only. Then you have an HO6. And this is a, there's a loud, loud car out there. An HO6 is a condo policy. So this is when you, when you own a condo, you would need an HO6. Now, the condo is, um, we're gonna say upgrades. And the reason we say that is because in a condo policy, it, it means that there is a 
that there's a building and that someone owns the building and you own this unit and you would get the HO6. But there's someone who owns a policy on the whole building. Okay, so someone has a policy on the whole building and you have a policy on your little unit. If this condo, were, if this building were to completely burn down, the building's owner would rebuild the whole structure, even your unit, even your flooring, even your walls, they would redo everything. The only thing is, is that this policy will be the base model. And what we mean by that is like the cheap flooring, the cheap countertops, the cheap paint, the bare bones, they will rebuild it though. Your policy in conjunction with this policy will work to put in the upgrades. So like if the base model is um, carpet, but you had wood flooring, your HO6 would pay for the difference between the carpet and the wood flooring so that you get the wood flooring. So your condo will be rebuilt completely and fully, whether you have insurance or not, but it will be built to the cheapest model possible. If you have anything better than that, you're going to want the condo policy to, to get those upgrades to make sure you get your granite countertops and your um, mahogany cabinets, whatever, so that you have the, the fancy stuff. The last policy is a HO8. There is no seven or one, um, but an HO8 is called a modified policy. Modified policy. Now, what is modified about this? An HO8 is where I like to say old house, but it's not. It's not just old, as in built in the 1920s and it's been remodeled. I mean old and it's still old, never remodeled like old. Um, but it's not always that case. Like what, what really is going on with the HO8 is that the market value is, let me make sure I say this right, less than rebuilt. What does this mean? Market value is what I can buy and sell it for. Buy and sell sell for. Rebuild is what it would cost to build it. So here, this is a big difference. If a house is already built and it's on a piece of land, I can sell it. And normally me selling an already built house on a piece of land is going to be more expensive than building just the house. Because when you're building just the house, you're not paying for the land. The insurance only cares about just the house. They don't care about the value of the land. So market value is your house and the land and the neighborhood and the popularity of where you live. That's market value. Typically market value is gonna be higher than rebuild. That just the cost of rebuilding the house. Not talking about the land, not talking about the popularity of your neighborhood, just rebuilding the house. An HOA, is where you can buy and sell the house for cheaper than it is to rebuild it from brand new. So this is very common in like Michigan where the housing market is like just tanked horribly and you can buy and sell a house for pennies compared to what it would cost to build a house. Now insurance companies do not like that. They do not like that you could, my cousin did this. He bought a house for like $15,000. It was a three bedroom two bedroom house in Mich two three bedroom two bathroom house in Michigan he paid 15,000 for the house and the land he buys an insurance policy which says if the house burns down we will rebuild it for $200,000 he paid 15 they're covering it for 200 they're like we don't like that you barely paid anything for the house but we're going to have to rebuild it if it completely burns down so what they do is they bare bones the policy. They make it as minimal as they can. And that's why it's called modified. They modified it so that you will file less claims than a regular homeowners. But if you had a regular house at a regular market value, you could have a regular homeowners. But if your market value is really low and the rebuild is really high, they don't want to give you a regular policy. They're going to give you a modified policy. <laughs> So market value is what you can buy and sell it for. 
Rebuild is what it would cost to build the house from the ground up. And if what you can buy or sell it for is cheaper than what it would cost to build it from the ground up, you're gonna get a modified policy. Now, what exactly is modified about it? First, it's gonna be limited perils. So when you learn about an HO2468, so we talked about broad form perils, Broad form is on two, a four, a six, and an eight. A two and four and six will have all the same. They will have all the same perils. An eight will be limited. It will have a lot less perils. Broad form would be wards, which is, um, and it's not necessary for you to memorize this necessarily, but wards would be wind, hail, aircraft, riot, vehicle, explosion, smoke, plus, BBB ice golf, which I don't even have those memorized. Um, burglary, bursting of heating systems, the weight of ice, uh, the way uh, uh, freezing is in there. BB ice golf, uh, freezing is in there. Um, all of those are covered on a two, four, six. An eight is pretty much wards only, and that's how they limit it. Now, again, you don't need to memorize these necessarily, but knowing that an HO8 is significantly limited compared to a two, a four, a six, you see how it's been modified. Whereas every other homeowners will cover all of this, wards and BBB ice golf, an HO8 covers basically wards only. It doesn't have this other stuff on it. So it's limited perils. That's one of the ways, oops, that's one of the things they do to modify it is it's limited perils. The other big thing is, uh, let me get a different color here. They, um, there is a thousand dollar theft limit and that is on premise only, on, uh, on premise only. What does that mean? Every other homeowners, two, four, six, three, five, whatever. Every other homeowners will cover theft no matter where it happens. You have a backpack with a laptop in it, stolen at Starbucks, stolen out of your car, stolen out of a friend's house. Every homeowner's policy you have would cover that, not an HO8. An HO8 says that your backpack with the laptop would have to be stolen at the house in order for it to be covered. So not only is it a $1,000 theft limit, which is crazy because we usually have a lot more stuff than $1,000 to be stolen, not only is it a thousand dollar theft limit, it is on premise only. Every other homeowners will cover your stuff being stolen anywhere in the world, not an HOA. Your stuff, if it is gonna be stolen, has to be stolen literally from your house in order for it to be covered. But if it's stolen outside of the house, uh-uh, not covered. The other thing about an HOA is that they only cover um, $250 per tree. Every other homeowners covers trees at $500 per tree. HOA, 250 per tree. So that's another way that it's been modified. Now, a big phrase that will pop up with an HOA, especially when we look at market value and rebuild, sometimes the market value or the rebuild, um, when a house is this old, they usually have what is called like plaster walls, which is how they used to make walls in the past. Plaster is like, like very hard, very hard cement. Um, this is drywall, not plaster. Drywall is a piece of board and they just nail it to the wood. Plaster was like wet cement and they would have to like dry it. That was the only way they used to make walls before drywall was invented. So before we had drywall, we made walls with plaster, but it was like wet cement and it could take a lot of work to build those walls. So when your house burns down, they're not gonna rebuild it with plaster. Even if, let's say you have plaster walls because it's an old house and just the kitchen burns down. Everything else about the house is fine. They rebuild the kitchen. They're not gonna use plaster. They're gonna use drywall. And what they call that is Functional replacement cost. Functional replacement cost. Functional replacement says that they will replace 
the the thing with the most modern, less expensive material. So even if you have plaster walls, they're not going to use plaster to rebuild it. They're going to use drywall, which is the modern, less expensive construction material. Functional replacement is always attached to an HO8 because HO8s usually are houses with plaster walls and plaster walls is the main example scenario they use to explain functional replacement. It could be, it could be anything, any sort of outdated materials. Like, um, I don't know, maybe they only ever used metal pipes before for plumbing and now they use PCV, public or plastic pipes. Whatever is modern and less expensive, they're going to use that. But drywall is the one, drywall versus plaster is what they tend to talk about the most. So it's the example that I use. Okay, so in summary, we've got a few different types of homeowners. You've got the two or three or five, which is a regular house. Uh, it just depends on how much coverage you have. Two will be broad coverage, the, the basic homeowner's policy. A three will be a little bit better because it's open perils on the walls and the roof, but it's named perils on the stuff inside. A five is the best because it's open, open. It's open on the outside, open on the inside, and it covers mysterious disappearance. You have an HO4, which is a renter's policy, contents only. It covers your shoes, your, your clothes, your furniture, but it, it's not concerned with the walls and the roof because you don't own the walls and the roof. A condo policy is an HO6. That is for upgrades. The owner of the building will rebuild the whole building and just you are covering your condo and your upgrades with your HO6. And the HO6 policy will work with the condo owner's building to rebuild your building and make sure that you get all the upgrades necessary. Then you have the HO8, which is modified. This is where market value is less then rebuild. So what you can buy and sell it for is less than what you would cost to build it brand new. When that happens, they limit your perils. The biggest limit is putting a thousand dollar theft limit on premise only for an HO8 and that it's a 250 per tree, whereas every other homeowners is 500 per tree. Okay. Um, any questions from this? You feeling good so far? Feeling good. Okay, good. All right, let's check in to see if I got any emails about missed class or anything. Oops, she did, she called me. Uh, oh, okay, her son is sick. Okay, no problem. Okay, um, one thing, one question. Okay, this, is a, this could be an exam question. You are renting a condo. What policy do you get? You are renting a condo. What policy do you get? Uh, HO6. Renting a condo. Yeah, renting. yeah. The keyword will be renting. So they try, renting. they try, they try and trick you and they say you're in a condo and you immediately go HO6. But then they're like, you're renting it. That immediately means HO4. So whether you're That's renting fine. a house, you're renting a condo, you're renting a trailer you're renting a little studio, whatever it is that you're renting, it'll be a renter's. It doesn't matter what type of property it is. A condo is for condo owners, not condo renters, because a renter's is for any type of renter. So wanted to catch you. I've, I've, I've been caught on that a few times because I'll read it too quickly. And I go, oh, HO6, that's a condo HO6. And I'll get it wrong. And it's like, ah, oh, it's because it's renter, renting an HO6. So if you're renting a condo, that's going to be an HO4, not an HO6. So make sure you pay attention to that. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about the coverages of homeowners. If my mouse would cooperate with me. All right. Let me delete this so we can write it all fresh and pretty. Oh, now my mouse went away. Okay. Come on. My pen suddenly stopped working. There we go, okay. All right, so now we are doing coverages of homeowners.
Okay, so you have coverage A, B, C, make some space, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Coverages A through D are known as section one. Um, actually, let me, let me make some more space here. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Ah, <laughs> it's not letting me move it how it's supposed to. All right, let me just fix this. Okay, we'll stay where we're at. Okay. Section one, property. And E and F are section two, and they use a Roman number two. And this is liability. So that's a test question. Section one, what is section one of a homeowner's? Property. What is section two of a homeowner's? Liability. So property is about me and my stuff my furniture, my house, my walls, my having to stay at a hotel if my house burns down, it's me and my stuff. Section two liability is you and your stuff. If I hurt you, I broke into, I broke something of yours, that is, that is E and F. So section two is liability and liability is other people, other people's property, other people's stuff. So section one property is for me. I'm number one. Section one, me and my stuff, my house, my shed, my stuff. Section two, liability, you and your stuff. It's other people's stuff. So section one is for me and my stuff. Section two is for you, liability. So what are these coverages? So you have um, coverage A, which is known as uh, dwelling. And what it means is walls and roof, walls and roof. So this is basically just the main structure of the house. If, if you had a house with nothing in it, that's A. Everything you see, if it's an empty house, that's coverage A. It's just covering the walls and the roof of, of the house. Now there's a couple of other definitions with, with A. Not only does it cover the walls and the roof, it will cover anything used to service the property. Service the property. This could be like a lawnmower. If you are using a lawnmower to service the property, then the lawnmower would actually fit the definition of A. The other thing that will fit the definition of A is any materials or supplies, materials or supplies that are next to the house that will become a part of the house. So let's say you're like redoing your roof and you get a pallet of roof tiles delivered in and, the, um, and they're next to your house and you plan to install them on the weekend. And before you have the chance to do that, it is stolen. That will be covered under coverage A. So any materials or supplies that are next to the house that will become a part of the house are covered under coverage A. Could be wood to make a deck, could be tiles for the roof, tiles for the floor, whatever is stacked outside that will be used to do your house, remodel your house, make repairs to your house would be covered under coverage A. The next coverage is coverage B, and this is other structures, other structures. So you have the house, which is the main structure, the dwelling. Then any other structure you have, a shed, a gazebo, a detached garage, your fence, your gate, anything, any other structure that is not the house would be coverage B. And my memory trick for this is B in the backyard. Your building's in the backyard. Coverage B is buildings in the backyard. The shed, the gazebo, the detached garage, they're all in the backyard. Now, does it doesn't have to be in the backyard. That's just the memory trick. B for buildings in the backyard. The key thing about B is that it's detached. 
If you have a garage built into the house, that's all coverage A. But if the garage is detached, if there's a walkway, if there's space between the house and the garage, the garage would be other structures or B. And any other structure, gazebo, shed, fence, all of those would be coverage B. Coverage C is known as content. Contents or personal property. I, I honestly see them do both back and forth, like tomato, tomato almost. So coverage C is contents or personal property. Your clothes, your shoes, your furniture, your pots, your pans, everything that you would um, put in a U-Haul and take with you to the next house that you're living in would be contents. It's all your stuff. So that is coverage C contents. Coverage D is known as loss of use, loss of use. This is when your house burns down and you can't live there anymore because it's burned down. You're going to need to go to a hotel. So it's, it's additional living, money to, to live somewhere else. So if your house burns down, you can't live there, you're going to have to go to a hotel. You still have to pay your mortgage if you have one because the bank still requires a mortgage, even if your house is burned down, your insurance will rebuild it. You're still paying your mortgage and your insurance will pay your hotel bill. So any, any money that you're, you're spending to live additionally away from the home because the home is unlivable will be covered under loss of use. Another thing that it covers is fair rental value. Now this only applies if you are renting a renting a room. So if you live in your house and then you're renting a room to someone and then the house burns down, they're not going to pay you miss rent money because they can't live in the house. So if you were renting the room before the house burned down and the house burns down, the insurance will not only pay money for you to stay at a hotel, they will also pay you your missed rent money. So you're unable to collect that miss rent money they will pay it for you while they are making repairs. Now, how much money do you get for all of this? Coverage A is going to be the main coverage. And coverage A will be based off the features of the home. So if it's like a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house, it will be, you know, $250,000. If it is a five-bedroom, five-bathroom mansion, it might be like $500,000. They're going to set it at whatever it would be to rebuild the house. Every other coverage after that will be based off of A. So A will be based off of what type of house is it, what type of materials were used to build it, and we will only know that once, once we assess the house. But every other coverage pretty much becomes a percentage of A. So B comes at a standard of 10% of A. So whatever A is, B will be 10% of that. Coverage C comes at 50% of A. So whatever A is, C will be 50% of A. D comes at 30%. So whatever A is, D will be 30% of that. So for an example, just so we can, oops, that's not what I meant to do. For an example, if we had um, a, if we had like a DP2, whatever, and it had, um, oh, sorry, I saw what I meant. <clears throat> we have a DP2, you have coverage A, B, C, D. If A is 100,000, then B would be 10,000 because that is 10%. C is 50%, so that'll be 50,000. And D is 30%. So that'll be 30,000 and that's out of a hundred thousand. You won't ever need to like do the math really to figure these out, but it's just good to see a few different examples and see how B is 10%, C is 50%, D is 30%. Now, technically speaking, these numbers 50, 30 and, and 10, 15, 30 only apply to an HO two, three and five because on a four and a six, you don't even have uh, a four, you don't even have A, you don't have B. A four starts at C. And then on a six, you may not have a lot of A. Like 
if you don't have a lot of upgrades, you're not going to need a lot of A. So on an HO6, if you have barely any A, you can't say, well, I need 50% of barely any. <laughs> so um, on a condo, they don't use these percentages either, but they never ask you that. They do ask what are the percentages. So do memorize B is 10%, C is 50%, D is 30%. Know that that doesn't technically apply to every single policy, but it really doesn't matter for the purposes of the state exam. They're not going to try and trick you about B on an H of four. It just doesn't exist. So they're not even going to ask you about it. Okay. All right. So um, these are our main coverage. So these are our property coverages. Sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse here to work. So coverage A, dwelling the main structure of the house, the walls and the roof, anything used to service the property and any materials or supplies next to it. Coverage B, other structures, the buildings in the backyard, the shed, the gazebo, the detached garage, all out in the backyard. Coverage C is that contents, your personal property, your clothes, your shoes, your furniture, your pots, your pans. Um, that's all covered at the 50%. And then your loss of use, that fair rental value if you have a tenant who can't live with you anymore, and then additional living. Um, if you need to go stay at the hotel, that's what will kick in for coverage D. Now, section two, liability, the other stuff. So the first one, section uh, coverage E is known as liability. Liability. And this means that you are liability, L-I-T-Y. I have to shut up a little bit. Liability says that you are at fault. You are guilty. Li coverage E, liability, guilty. So coverage E says that you are guilty and you have liability to pay out to someone. So we can even take this further. It is your doggy. Your doggy bit me. Liability. Coverage E. I am guilty. That is coverage E. So if you have a dog and it bites someone, they can go to the hospital, get that medical bill taken care of through your liability coverage. And it doesn't have to be a dog bite. It could be anything. So somebody, um, you, uh, I don't know, sprayed off your, your driveway, caused someone to slip and fall. Um, you accidentally tripped, you accidentally tripped and fell, caused someone else to trip and fall, and then they sue you. Um, any kind of things that you're accidentally responsible for would be liability. Your kid, as long as they're young enough, if they beat someone up on the playground at school, liability can cover that. You're at a museum, your kid knocks something over, liability can cover that. So liability is when you're guilty and you're at fault and it is your responsibility to fix. Um, and usually I like to say it's your enemy that you use coverage E for because they're going to want to sue you. There is a lot of money available on coverage E, like it's at least a hundred thousand. So it's a lot of money. <clears throat> Whereas coverage F is known as med pay and you are not, not at fault. You are not guilty for this. This is more like, I'm sorry you, you fell down near my house. Here's some money to pay for your medical bill, but I'm not accepting blame or fault. I just feel bad. So that is like coverage F. So I like to say coverage F is for friends. Friends who are like, hey, I need money to pay my chiropractor bill since I slipped down your stairs, but I'm not trying to sue you for millions. So they would just use coverage F. And coverage F is usually a, a lot smaller where coverage E might be 100,000, 300,000, 500,000. Coverage F might be 3,000, 5,000, maybe 10,000. Like it's a much smaller amount of money than coverage E. And that's section two, liability. Um, a couple of things with coverage F because they love to ask is um, you actually do have to have a medical bill. So you do have to have a medical bill. This isn't pain and suffering or mental anguish. You must have a medical bill. And then the other thing is, is that you may have to submit to a physical exam. Submit to a physical exam as often as requested. Okay, so if they're gonna be paying your payments for you, your medical bills for you, 
they might want to confirm that you are indeed actually sick. And so they may say, you need to go to our doctor to confirm that you are indeed sick or injured or whatever it is. And that's the, um, the medical payments. Okay. So whew, that was a lot. <laughs> so this was a brief rundown of your homeowners. You definitely want to remember the names, HO4, HO2, HO5, all the names of those. All the coverages, types, coverage A, dwelling, coverage B, other structure, coverage C, contents, coverage D, loss of use, coverage E, liability, coverage F, medical payment. That's six questions right there for sure that they love to ask about. Section one is property. Section two is liability. That's another two questions. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, they can ask all sorts of questions from everything else that we talked about here. Okay. So any questions about any of all of this? Nope, so far so good. Okay. Now there are going to be some other things um, in homeowners um, that they, they like when you read it, there's going to be like additional coverages, supplementary coverages, exclusions, all kinds of stuff. I'm just going to pinpoint a couple of things that you want to know um, without having to like study too hard because there's so much going to be within these chapters. So let's just talk about a couple of things. Freezing. They, oh my gosh, what is happening to my board when he does that? There's a button on my, my pen and when I hit it, it does that and I don't know how to manage it. Anyway, stop. <laughs> no, stop. Stop it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, freezing. Freezing is covered if you took steps to maintain heat. Now it doesn't, they're gonna ask you about a two or a three and they try to act like it's all different because a three is open and a, and a, and a two is named. But no matter what, freezing is only covered if you took steps to maintain heat in the house. So like if you're going, if you live in a place where it snows and it's winter time and you're like, I'm gonna go to Florida and get out of here and I'm just gonna turn off the heat cause I'm not living here and I don't wanna pay that bill and you go to Florida and then you come home and your house is flooded because the pipe froze and then burst, um, you're not gonna be covered. You need to show that you actually maintained heat in the house to prevent the pipes from freezing like that. You could also drain the pipes, but they really generally will focus on maintain heat. So that's the most common phrase that you'll see when they talk about freezing. Freezing is only covered if you took steps to maintain heat. Um, exclusions. The two biggest exclusions that you want to know, again, I don't spell very, so right very well, um, earth movement, earth movement, and water damage. Earth movement and water damage. These are the two main exclusions, whether it's a two, a four, a six, an eight, a three, a five, I don't care. These are the two exclusions on every homeowner's policy is earth movement and water damage. And with water damage, you can read that as flood too. Because um, with water, outside water coming in, they don't cover that. So any outside water coming in is excluded. That's what they mean by water damage. Outside water coming in is excluded. So that would be like a flood or rain or a neighbor spraying the hose at you. Any outside water coming in, not covered. Now, if you had a pipe burst and unrelated to freezing, let's just say you had a pipe break and it flooded the house, that would be covered because it's your pipe and it's your water. But if it's outside water coming in, no coverage for that. And then earth movement, would be like an earthquake um, that that would be excluded. Now you can buy endorsements for, for both of these. So earth movement, you can buy a earthquake endorsement so that it would cover earthquakes. And then for water damage, there is a water sewer backup endorsement that you can buy. So you could do a water sewer backup endorsement if the sewer system backs up into your house, you actually have zero coverage for that. You would have to have purchased the, um, 
the endorsement for that. You'd have to buy the endorsement in order to get the water sewer backup um, covered. You could also buy a flood policy, but a flood policy is sold separately um, by the government. Um, it's not it's not on your regular policy. You'd have to buy a separate flood policy to have flood covered. Um, so those are the two big exclusions. And then in terms of earth movement, we want to remember that fire is always covered. Fire is always covered. So we didn't learn about dwelling policies, um, but they love to ask this, especially about a DP1, because a DP1 is bare bones, minimum, hardly covers a thing, barely covers anything <laughs> is a DP1. And so they like to ask questions on it to try and trick you. Well, fire is always covered, even on a DP1, even with earth movement. So let me explain this. You're, you might have a test question that'll say, a earthquake caused $5,000 of damage. The earthquake also started a fire, which caused $2,000 in damage. So you have earth movement at $5,000 and a fire that was started by earth movement that caused $2,000 of damage. How much will the insurance pay? Now, most people would say, oh, none of it's covered because all of it was started by earth movement. But, 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 fire is always covered. So in that case where it says 5,000 earth movement, 2,000 fire because of the earth movement, how much would be covered? 2,000. They would still cover the $2,000 fire, even though it was caused by earth movement because fire is always covered. So if they ask you that question, even on a DP1, which is like bare bones, hardly covers anything, this would still apply. That fire is always covered on the DP1. <clears throat> okay. I think the one other thing that can be a little bit tricky is um, knowing the, oops, uh, knowing the difference between um, major coverages and additional coverages. So your major coverages are the A through the F. And you know it's a major coverage because it has an A or an A, coverage A, coverage B, coverage C, coverage D. It's a major coverage. Then you have um, additional or supplementary. What is weird about these is that it is not additional premium. It is additional coverage, but it is not additional premium. There is no cost to additional or supplementary. I kind of like to think about it as like, if you go to a restaurant and you order a meal, you're paying for the meal. You're not necessarily paying for the plate, but the plate has to bring you the meal. Like it's all part of it. The additional or supplementary is like the plate or it's like the side dishes. Like it automatically comes with it. You can't take it off. It's part of it. So everyone has every additional or supplementary coverage, whether you need them or not. So for instance, one of the common supplementary coverages is lawn, trees, shrubs, and plants. And as we talked about earlier, a tree is typically $500 per tree, per tree on homeowners. And that is an additional or supplementary coverage. Every policy has lawn, trees, shrubs, or plants, but not every home has lawn, trees, shrubs, or plants. <clears throat> so whether you need it or not, it's automatically built onto the policy. Now, specifically, ah, this, they've changed the whiteboard, it's new, and now I gotta make sure I hit the right button. Specifically, one of the coverages they love to ask about. So coverage E is gonna be like 100,000. And remember, that's when the, the doggy um, bites me, and you're guilty, that's coverage E. Remember, doggy, bite me, guilty, coverage E. Um, at a minimum, it's 100,000. It could be 300,000, could be 500,000, whatever you pick. This money is all for the other person, the person that your dog bit. All of this money is for their medical bill. On top of this, you also have money for a lawyer. You have money for a lawyer. So like if you get sued by this person and they try to get 
millions of dollars or they're saying you did more than what you did or even if it's like frivolous and not even like your dog didn't even bite them and they're just claiming it whatever your insurance will give you money for a lawyer now the money for the lawyer is in addition to the limit it is in addition to the limit meaning you have a hundred thousand plus money for the lawyer the money for the lawyer does not come out of this limit. It is in addition to that limit. How much money you get for the lawyer doesn't matter. You're not tested on it. You just need to know that you have money for the lawyer in addition to the limit of coverage E. Now, most additional or supplementary are in addition to the limit. There's some exceptions, but most of the time, the, the additional or supplementary is giving you extra money to do extra things. And that's what they mean by in addition to the limit. You don't need to remember which ones are or are not in addition. You just need to know what that phrase means. If they say that this is in addition to the limit, you need to know that it means there is more money available than what is listed as the coverage. There will be more money available than what they have listed if it's an additional or supplementary coverage. Whew. Okay, that's the basics of homeowners. So the next hour of this class was dedicated for auto. Um, so do you have any questions on any of the homeowners stuff? How much math will I have? Ooh, okay. There is gonna be a math question um, on the exam and it's gonna be, um, coinsurance, coinsurance. Now, um, I actually have a really great video on YouTube about coinsurance, but there's two things that you need to know for math. One, you need to know how to find 80% of something because coinsurance says you need to carry as much coverage on your house as it would cost us to rebuild it. Like if you have a tiny house and you only need 100,000, carry 100,000. But if you have a big house and we need 300,000 to rebuild it, carry 300,000. Carry as much coverage as you need to rebuild it. That's kind of the whole point. And that's called insurance to value. Insurance to value says carry as much coverage as you need to rebuild the house. Coinsurance says you can carry less but please carry at least 80 because most homeowners insurance claims, because like the ultimate idea of homeowners is that if it burns down, they will rebuild it. That's the main goal. My house burns down, you rebuild it. However, that rarely if ever happens, your whole house burning down. The majority of homeowners claims are for 250,000, or sorry, 25,000. 25,000, that's it. Not even 100,000, a quarter of that. So most homeowners claims are tiny compared to what you're actually covering. So if you have like a decent sized house, your homeowners may be 500,000, like that's coverage A, and you're paying a premium for that, 500,000. But most of the claims you file will be for 25,000. So most homeowners claims are tiny compared to what you're actually covering. However, you need to cover that much for that one-off situation in case your house burns down. Coinsurance is trying to compromise a little bit. It's saying, look, we know that most homeowners claims will not be the full amount of coverage that we're telling you to have. So if you wanna drop what we're telling you to have to at least 80%, so if we say that you should have 100,000, if you at least carry 80, we'll be okay. We, we won't pay your claims differently. We won't do anything differently. We'll, we'll, we'll cover your house as normal. But when you try to cover your house for less than 80%, we don't like that. You're, you're not covering your, because I'm mad, like, think about it, like physically, if this represents a house and full coverage would be the whole house, but you're only covering 80% of it, you're basically only covering the downstairs. The, uh, the upstairs attic isn't covered when you think about 80%. They're okay with that. 
they will they will accept that but if you say i want i want the house and they so again our, our scenario is it's a hundred thousand if they say it's a hundred thousand and you decide to carry only eighty thousand they're okay with that but if you say if you if they say the house is a hundred thousand and you only want to carry 50 which would be only half the house they're not going to pay the claim in full that's not fair you're not covering the full house they're not going to cover the full claim now again they're cool with 80 percent. as long as you cover 80 percent, they'll pay the claim like normal if you carry less than 80 percent, they will use the coinsurance equation to pay your claim so one you need to know what is 80 percent in your calculator so in your calculator you're going to be given all sorts of rebuild numbers. So when they they're going to tell you your house could be rebuilt for 200,000 or this guy bought a house and the rebuild was 320,000. They're going to give you a bunch of numbers. You're going to need to know how to find 80% of those numbers. You do that by doing this equation in your calculator. So in your calculator, you put in the number, the rebuild number. So that would be the 200 or the three, whatever number they give you, you put in the number for the rebuild, whatever that number is, that number will always change. Then you're gonna multiply that times the loss, times the claim. They say there was a $5,000 fire, $20,000 fire, that's the loss. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm doing two different equations here. That's when we do the equation, sorry. The 80%, sorry, sorry, sorry. You put in the number you're looking for, so whatever, times 0 0.80. This is the 80%. I'm gonna show you what I mean in a calculator here in a second. So if you put in the number you're looking for times 0 0.80, you're basically converting the 80% into a decimal. And that's all you do to convert a percent into a decimal. You just get rid of the percent sign and put a decimal in front of the number and boom, you converted it from a percent to a decimal. You can't put percentages in the calculator because it's too dumb. You have to convert it to a decimal. All you need to do is take 80% and put 0 0.80 and you've converted it. So, so let's say we're doing 320. So that's the number we're looking for. So we're going to put 320,000 times 0 0.80 equal and that will be our answer so let's get a calculator up calculator i cannot help you honey all right calculator so um we wanted to find 80 percent of 320 so this is our rebuild so you have 300 oh, i'm sorry three hundred and twenty thousand times 0 0.80 equal and that'll be 256. So one, you need to know how to find 80%. So you take the rebuild number, whatever that rebuild number is, times 0 0.80 will equal 80%. Now here's where you need to know the 80%. Okay, so they're gonna give you a math problem. I'm gonna give you two different examples for coinsurance. So let's say, um, so we, they're gonna give you rebuild and then they're gonna give you the claim. Oh, and then what do they carry it as? And then the claim. So here's how they're gonna give you the problem and they're gonna give you like a wordy math problem. They're gonna say, Bob bought a house and the rebuild was um, 300,000. Bob decided to only carry 250,000. He had a $30,000 claim. How much did the insurer pay? That is how they're going to word coinsurance questions. They're going to tell you that he bought a house and that the rebuild was whatever. He carried only this much and he had a claim. How much of the claim will they pay? Now, 
If he is carrying, if he is carrying 80% of 30,000, they will pay the claim in full, no question asked, as long as he is within 80% of 300,000. If he is less than 80% of 300,000, they will not pay the claim in full and they will do a math problem called the coinsurance equation to figure out how much they're gonna pay you. Because essentially coinsurance is saying, you were cheap, I'm gonna be cheap. So if the person was cheap and carrying coverages for their home, the insurance company will be cheap when they pay the claim. But if you're carrying 80%, they won't even ask, they'll just pay the claim like normal. So let's find out if this guy is within 80% or not. So the first step that you have to do, so your steps to a coinsurance, your steps to coinsurance. One, what is 80%? What is, or are they carrying, actually like, are they carrying 80%? That's your first step. Are, are they carrying 80%? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, then pay the claim as normal. Pay the full claim. If the answer is no, then you're going to need to do step two, which we'll talk about. So let's do step one. We need to find 80% of 300,000. So in our calculator, in our calculator, we're gonna put in 300,000 times 0 0.80 equals. So let's get our calculator and do that. 300,000, oops, that's 3 million. 300,000 times 0 0.80 equal 240, 240. So is he within 80%? He's carrying 250, which means he's more than 80%. So since the answer is yes, they're going to pay the claim in full. Your answer would be 30,000 and you are done. Nothing else is needed for that question. Because in this question, he was carrying at least 80. And as long as you're carrying 80 or more, and he was 10,000 more than 80, the claim is covered as normal. No coinsurance equation needed, no step two needed. Because as soon as he is carrying at least 80 or more than 80, claim is paid in full, end of story, okay? That's one type of coinsurance question they give you is just finding the 80%, confirming that they are carrying at least 80% and paying the claim in full. The next one we're going to do where you're, you're actually going to have to do step two. So let's do the next one. So let's say we have rebuild, uh, carry, what did they actually carry and what is the claim? So let's say that our rebuild is 250. He decided to carry 190 and the claim was for 40,000. And they're going to ask you, what did the insurer pay? So we're going to do step one, 80%, yes or no. So we have to do, we're going to put it into our calculator, 250,000 times 0 0.80 equal. So let's get our calculator out, clear this out, 250, 250,000 times 0 0.80 equal 200,000, 200,000. So the answer is no, he is not within 80%. He is carrying less than 80%. And since he is carrying less than 80%, we're gonna need to do step two. And step two is do the coinsurance equation. Do the coinsurance equation. What is the coinsurance equation? The coinsurance equation is what did you carry? What did you carry divided by what you 
should carry, and here's something that is very important, 80%. The should carry is not the rebuild. The should carry is the 80%. The should carry is the 80% because they're cool if you cover at least 80%. So if you cover at least 80%, then they're cool with it. So whatever the number you put down here is not the rebuild. It's going to be the 80% of the rebuild. It'll be 80% of rebuild. Okay. Then you're going to multiply that times the loss and that will equal the claim payout. Okay, so what did you carry divided by what you should carry, which is 80% of rebuild times the loss will equal the claims payout. So in our example here, let me try and. So we have in, in our example, he did carry a hundred. Oh, I want to make that a little bigger. Okay. He did carry 190,000. He should have carried the 80% of 250, which was 200,000. So we're gonna put that at the bottom. We don't put the full, ah, go away. Sorry, my Zoom meeting handles are in my way. We don't put the full, um, the full rebuild down here. Where'd my mouse go? There it is. Ah, what the heck? My pen disappeared. Why are you doing that? <laughs> oh my gosh. What did I do? There we go. Okay. Um, 200,000. So he did carry 190,000. He should have carried 200, which was 80% of 250. We're going to multiply that times the loss, which was 40,000. Oops. 40,000, and that will equal the claim payout. So let's do it in our calculator. And when you do it in your calculator, by the way, you got to take it one little step at a time because the calculator is not smart. So let me show you what I mean. So first you're going to do 190,000, 190,000. Can you see my calculator, by the way? Yes, it's good. Okay, good. I was like, didn't know if I was sharing my screen or the whiteboard. And I was like, wait. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Okay. So 190,000 divided by 200,000. Oops. Equals. So you have to hit the equal sign. You can't go 190 divided by 250 times 4,000. You've got you've to hit the equal sign in between because the calculator you're going to get for the state exam, which you're allowed to have one. It's just going to be a little bit dumb. It won't be able to handle all of these equations in one. So you need to do 190 divided by 200,000 equal, then hit the multiplication sign times 40,000 equals 38. So in this instance, he was only 10,000 shy of 80%. So they're going to pay pretty close to the claim amount. The closer you are to the 80%, it's not so bad. The further away you get from the 80%, the worse the claim payout gets. So this was just a couple examples and I have a video on YouTube and then um, included in the notes that I'm gonna send you is more notes that explain coinsurance too. So you can walk yourself through a couple of examples if you need to. So do you have any um, questions on this one? No, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Any other homeowners questions that you have or dwelling property policy questions in general? Yeah. So dwelling, is that for only rental? What's the purpose of dwelling? Okay. So dwelling, and this will be included in the notes that I send you to. I have a whole document that explains dwelling, so I won't go too heavy into it, but dwelling is typically purchased by landlords, people who care about the wall and the roof but they don't care about the stuff inside, which is why dwelling policies don't come with coverage C. It's available if because you don't have to be a landlord to buy a dwelling, but it's typically mostly purchased by landlords. The biggest difference between dwelling and homeowners, dwelling says you don't have to live there. And so they have minimal coverages and things are a little bit different. 
homeowner says you must live there. And that's the biggest difference is dwelling doesn't have to be owner occupied. They don't care if you live there or not. So landlords will typically purchase dwelling where the main focus is covering the house, the walls and the roof. Whereas a homeowner says you must live there and it will come with all the coverages automatically. Whereas dwelling is more like a la carte, you pick and choose what you want. Does that make sense? Got it. Thank you so much. Perfect. Yes. And like, uh, like if I was, if I owned a house and I was renting it to you, I would get a dwelling, you would get an HO4. Because you would be renting out my property. So you would need renters and I would cover the, the house as a dwelling. Um, and like I said, in the notes that I send you, there'll be a whole document that explains um, dwelling. And if you're re-watching the recording of this and you want the notes, shoot me an email, I'll send them to you. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you very much. Oh, you're so welcome. And are you sure you don't have any other questions? You got me live right now. No, everything has been very clear. You can't get any more clearer. <laughs> All right. Now, for the purposes of this recording, I, I'm going to just start talking about auto. I think you're you're done with auto, though. So you good? Yes, on auto, I'm done with auto. Okay, so you can feel free to leave. I'm going to keep going because I'm going to make this recording for homeowners and auto. Um, so have a good night. Email me if you need any other help, though, okay? Yes, thank you for everything. Have a good night. You're welcome. Okay, so for those on the recording, let's talk about auto. Uh, oops, let's get that bigger. I think it's my whiteboard it needs to be different. There we go. Let's zoom in on the whiteboard. Oh, no, I don't want to go that far. I got to learn how to work this thing. No, that's too skinny. Let me start a new one. Sometimes when I mess around with it too much, it, um, oh, it's my whole system. All right, I'm gonna pause this real quick. Oh my gosh, everything messing up for me. There we go. Okay, so I just need to change out my whiteboard here. All right, so let's talk about auto. Auto, oh, okay, wait, oops. <laughs> I don't have a pen. There we go, okay. All right, and the recording started again. I just need to make sure now. Yes, okay, all right. Auto insurance, auto insurance. Okay, the first things we wanna know are the parts to an auto policy. And you wanna memorize all parts of the um, auto policy. Oh, this is not the same whiteboard, okay. All right, so the parts of an auto policy, you have, um, Part A, part A, which is liability. Now this is for everyone else. This is for the people that you hit. So if you crash into someone else and, and the people in that car, the other car are hurt and injured, liability what pays to them. It is for their medical bills. So just like we talked about on homeowners, Section one, property, me and mine. Section two, liability, you and yours. Liability is the other people. So it'll be the other people in the accident is part A. So the other people in the other car, coverage A is what pays out to them. So if you crash into them, coverage A is what will pay out to them. So part A is liability pays out to the <laughs> other um, guys. Then you have part B which is known as medical payments. Now, medical payments are for you and your people. So the people in your car. So if, if now, if you're, if you're at fault for the accident, so you caused it, you would use A to cover them, the other car, and you would use B to cover you and the passengers in your car. If someone else hit you and they are responsible, you would use their coverage A, you wouldn't really need B. 
So B is used when you're at fault or when you're a pedestrian. And, and, and like, it doesn't mean you're at fault, like you're not at fault for hurting them, but you're at fault for the accident in general. And then coverage B will pay for anybody in your car. Now it doesn't mean you'll never use B if someone else hits you. You can always use B anytime you're hurt in your car, anytime you're hurt in your car. But just generally speaking, if you were hit by someone else, you would use their A. You wouldn't need a whole lot of your B if they have A and you're using their A. So coverage A is liability pays to other people. Coverage B is medical payments and it pays to you and the passengers um, in your car. So that is coverage B. Part C is known as, um, I'm gonna run out of space here. <laughs> I can't move. I can't move this whiteboard. The other one, I'm allowed to move it up and down. Anyway, okay. Part C is uninsured. I'm just gonna. Okay. Sorry, I gotta do this fresh. Part A, liability. Part B, medical or med pay. They usually abbreviate it as med pay, medical pay. One key thing per person that's the thing they love to test you on is per person quite a bit so make sure you remember memorize that part c is uninsured or underinsured uninsured or underinsured now um um this is abbreviated as um underinsured and then Underinsured is U-I-M, because this is this is a motorist. The last word in here is motorist. So it's uninsured motorist or underinsured motorist. And we abbreviate uninsured as U-M and underinsured as U-I-M. Now, uninsured means they have no insurance. And underinsured means they have not enough insurance, not enough insurance. Okay. So what we're saying here is, um, so let's say we have, this is um, the at fault car at fault. And then they crash into you and you are innocent, <laughs> innocent of the accident. Their, their coverage A, their coverage A is supposed to pay out to you. So whatever medical injury bills, their coverage A is supposed to pay out to you. Now, if they only have, so this is called split limit, 25, 50, 25. Split limit is just anytime they split up the limits of liability. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if this person in car and at the at fault blue car, so they're at fault. They're the reason the accident happened. And they're only carrying 25, 50, 25, which is a typical state minimum limit. They crashed into you and you're innocent and your medical bill is 40,000. That is not enough. Um, no insurance would be, they had no A. Like if they didn't have any of this and this car hits you and they have no insurance, that would be uninsured. If they had the 25, 50, 25, and you're injured at 40, that would be underinsured. Where they had 25, but you need 40. So that would be under. So part A is what pays to the other people, but part C is what pays to you when the other people who hit you don't have enough coverage. So you use your own part C. And in fact, on the, on the entire auto policy, you also have part D. And there's also E and F, although they don't, talk too much about E and F. Um, just in case, part E is duties after a loss. So this would be um, if you, you have to call the insurance company after an accident, you need to update them. You need to let them know. You need to get a police report if it's a hit and run or a, nine, uh, a hit and run or theft. Um, duties after a loss are the things you have to do after an accident. It's a pretty common sense list. The, the one to memorize is you need 911 for hit and run or theft. Those are the two times you must have a police report. Hit and run or theft require 911. 
Um, so that's duties. And then F is general provisions, and which basically just means rules. They rarely, if ever, ask about E or F. Some of your textbooks may not even teach it. But just in case, E and F, E is duties after a loss. Call 911 for a hit and run or theft. F is general provisions, which simply means rules. And the rules are whether or not you're bankrupt, they have to pay the claim like normal. Um, no benefit to Bailey, which says um, you cannot use your insurance to benefit a Bailey. And a Bailey is someone you pay money to. So if you drop your car off at a repair shop, and the repair shop in the course of fixing your car takes it on a test drive and destroys it or crashes into it, their insurance needs to pay for that, not yours. So no benefit to Bailey says that the repair shop cannot use your insurance if they broke your car. Um, and then subrogation is another provision. Subrogation is where if you're, if you're not at fault for the accident, but your insurance pays, and then they go after the responsible third party, the person who actually caused the accident, that is subrogation. So all of those are under general provisions. Um, but the main ones are A, B, C, and D. D is damage to your auto, damage to your auto. And that's gonna give you the comp, uh, the collision and other than collision. Other than collision is frequently called comprehensive, but for some, and, and you know it probably is comprehensive, but the state exam won't call it comprehensive. They call it other than collision. So they'll call it collision and other than collision, but that represents collision, comp and collision. And um, that's what we would typically call as full coverage if you were to have both of these. But full coverage is a fake term. It's not real. It's not, I mean, it's not an actual insurance term. It's a consumer term. We only say it to customers, but that's not an actual phrase of the policy. But that was B part D. So um, one of the things I wanted to mention here was when you look at the, the breakdown of the exam, part A pays to others, but part C, D, or part B, C, and D are all for you. So these are coverages that kick in for you on the on the, the the car policy only part a is for other people so it's like reversed of a homeowners where homeowners had section one me and my stuff and the bottom was other people auto is reversed auto says section one is for other people and then the other is for um, me and my stuff okay now um, so definitely remember the parts part a liability part b medical payments per person Part C, uninsured, underinsured. Part D, damage to your auto. Now we're gonna talk about part A and get into that because there's a lot of um, tricky questions with that one. Okay, so for coverage, uh, so for part A, you can either do what is called a combined single limit. Sorry if I spelled that wrong. <laughs> combined single limit, or you can do split limit. A combined single limit will say you get $300,000 or whatever the number is for whatever happens. A split limit says you have to split it up like 25, 50, 25. Um, a split limit is gonna pay out a lot less money than a combined single limit. Because in a split limit, they break it up by bodily injury and by property damage and even per person bodily injury. So in, when you have a split limit, the insurance company um, will only pay at most this number per person. So even if you hit one person and they're injured at 50,000, they're only gonna get 25 because it's limited by person. So your limit may be 50, but each person can only get 25 because this is a per person bodily injury limit. They're only gonna get 25. On a combined single limit, they'll get whatever they need. There's no limitation per person. There's no limitation bodily injury versus property damage. Bodily injury is bodily injury, property damage, oh, that should be PD. 
property damage is like the broken car, the broken stop sign, the broken gate that you crashed into, bodily injury is medical bills. They split it up and they say, you can only spend 50 on body and you can only spend 25 on property. With a combined single limit, you can spend all of it on one thing, all of it equally divided. They don't care. You use this full amount for the full accent, however it gets divided. There's no rules about how they divide it. You're just limited to the 300,000. In the split limit, you are limited by person, you're limited by bodily, and you're limited by property. So they split the limit up and each limit has its own category. So they won't ask you too much about combined single limit other than asking you, what is it called when there is one limit for everything that happens? Combined single limit. When they're not splitting it, when there's just one limit for whatever happens, it's combined single limit. Most of the questions will be split limit because split limit is definitely the most common. So let's talk about split limit. You have three numbers. You have 20, and these, are, these, these can be different, 25, 50, 25. The pink represents per person bodily injury per person bodily injury so for one single person no matter how extensive their bodily injury is from the accident the most that this one person can get is 25,000 that's the most doesn't matter even if you're injured at a million dollars the most you can get is 25 thousand. The second number is total bodily injury, which means that the pink number is telling you how you're allowed to divide this number. You don't have 25 plus 50. You have 50 and each person can take 25. So basically you can hit two people at 25 a piece for a total of 50,000. Now, of course, if you injure three or four people, you can cover them up to the 50, but no one person can get more than 25. And I'll show you what that looks like. The last number is property damage. And this is total property damage. And remember property damage is um, crashing a light post, crashing into a car, crashing into a building. That is the property damage coverage. And it does, and it, this could be for one car, 10 cars, 20 cars. However many cars you damage, you can fix them up to 25,000. So you're limited no more than 25,000 for the whole accident. So now these numbers could be different. It could be 50, 125, 100, 300, 100, all kinds of numbers, 15, 30, 10, if you're in Arizona. The numbers themselves don't matter. You want to know the meaning of the number. And the first number is per person bodily injury. The second number is total of all bodily injury. And the third number is 25 total for all property damage. Now we're going to do a couple of, of instances here to kind of show you how this per person works. Okay, so let's say you have 25, 50, 25, and you crash into four people. Let's say dad is injured at 30,000, mom is injured at 20,000, brother is injured at 15,000, and sister is injured at 5,000. So these are all people that you, cra you crashed into a family of four, all of them are sent to the hospital, these are the amounts, the dollar amounts of their injuries. So in order to do this, we need to go down the line. So we say, how much does dad get? First, we have to check the per person. Dad cannot get more than 25. That's the per person limit. So even though he's injured at 30, he can get 25. Now we go to mom. Mom is injured at 20, which is well, which is below the per person. So we're good. She's going to get 20. Now, at this point, we have spent 25 and 20 for a total of 45. You only have 50. 
So when we look at brother, we say brother was injured at 15. All he can get is five because that is all that is available. We already spent 45 between, so of our limit as 50, remember this number is telling you how you're allowed to divide this number. The most that each person can get is 25. So you have a total of 50, dad took 25, mom took 20, and so far we only have five left. So when we come down to brother, even though brother is injured at 15, which is well below the per person, we only have five left, so he's gonna get five, which means sister will get nothing in this instance. Now, in the real world, all of them will get something in proportion to their injuries. In the real world, they don't go dad first and then mom and then brother and then sister. I'm simply doing that to help you make sure you understand there is a per person limit and a total bodily injury limit and that no one person can get more than the per person limit and no one all together can get more than the total bodily injury limit, okay? You have to make sure you're checking both numbers. Now, here's how it will actually show up on the exam. They'll say, you have 50, 100. You hurt, and there, obviously this is gonna say a car accident. You hurt three people at 40,000 each, each, how much did the insurer pay? How much did the insurer pay? So this is how they're gonna ask it. They're gonna say, you have an auto policy which comes with the limits of 50,000 per person, 100,000 per accident. You were in a car accident and you hurt three people at 40,000 each. How much did the insurer pay? So they're not going to do person one, person two, person three. They're just going to say three people. So you would draw your three people. You say, okay, first person is injured at 50. Or sorry, first person is injured at 40. They can get up to 50. So they're going to get 40. Second person is injured at 40. They can get up to 50. We're good. So far, we have spent 80 of our 100. We've only got 20 left. That's how much they'll pay out for a total of 100,000. So your answer would be 100,000. But sometimes it's not always that beautiful. Like, like you can ease, like if you know math very well, you can say, oh, 40, 40, 40 would definitely hit over 100, but you're not going to get all 40, 40, 40. Um, that will be an answer choice. What is that? 40, 40, 40, 40 would be 160. That will be an answer choice. And it will be wrong because you are limited to 100. So this is more of how you'll do it. It won't be like dad, mom, brother, sister. We just did that to make sure you understand you've got to check the per person and the total injury amount. <clears throat> okay, so that was um, split limit. Now we want to talk about um, coverage B here real quick. So we're talking about coverage B. Part B is medical payments, medical payments. Now for this one, you're gonna, your medical payments will be like a set dollar amount, like 5,000, 3,000, 2,000, whatever. The key thing that you need to remember is that it is per person. Oops, per, per person? <laughs> per person because they are gonna ask you a question on the exam. It'll say, you have $5,000 of med pay. You hurt three people. And they'll say person one was injured at 7,000. Person two was injured at 3,000. Person four was injured at 8,000. And they'll say, how much did the insurer pay? If you simply read, you have 5,000 of med pay, period, you're gonna think, oh, 5,000. Even though I heard all these people at seven, three and eight, I only have five, only five will pay out. 
No, wrong. Per person, per person, per person. This 5,000 of med pay is per person and they are testing you on that. So the question won't say it. It won't say you have 5,000 of medical pay per person. It'll say you have 5,000 of medical pay and you hurt three people. You need to remember that it's per person. So when you're solving this out, you're gonna go, okay, first person is injured at seven, but the most they can get is five. Third person or second person is injured at three. They only need three. They're going to get three. Third person is injured at eight. The most they can get is five. So your answer would actually be 13,000, which is a lot different than 5,000. So you need to remember that it is per person per person. The other thing about medical payments is it's good for three years. And this is true for homeowners as well. It will pay payments for up to three years. So like if you're in a car accident and you need to go to the chiropractor and you're going like every week, they will pay the weekly bill till three years and then they'll be done or till the money runs out. If you end up spending that 5,000 before three years is up, then you're done, you're, you're done. Um, but you have up to three years to spend that money or to even file a claim for that money you have up to three years. The other thing is that um, you may need to submit to a medical exam, although they definitely ask that more on like homeowners than they do on auto. But as part of medical payments, the insurance company may require that you um, submit to a physical exam as often as requested. Um, and the last thing about medical payments is it covers anybody who is occupying your car and occupying could even mean trying to get in. So sometimes they'll ask a question that says like, your grandma was trying to get in the car, she slipped and fell, busted her ankle. What coverage does she have? Medical payments. She can use medical payments because she was trying to get into her car, into your car, which includes occupying. Medical payments will also work for pedestrians. If you're just an average person walking down the street, um, you're, you're not in your car, but you get hit by a car, then medical payments would pay out to you um, as well. All right, now we need to talk about uninsured, underinsured, because they're a little bit tricky on the way they pay that one out too. So remember we have uninsured versus underinsured. And remember that uninsured is no insurance and underinsured is not enough. Now, with uninsured, they're gonna pay it just like A, split limit, whatever the limits are, they pay it like that. They don't have to consider anything else because you were hit by someone who has no insurance. So there's no other insurance to consider. With underinsured, they are still looking at the person who hit you's insurance because you're gonna use up their insurance and then come over to your policy to see if there's anything available left over. Now, the way they do the math on underinsured doesn't seem very fair. So I'm going to explain it to you to make sure that you it makes sense to you. So let's say that we have Bob and Bob crashed into Joe. Now, let's say Bob has part A at twenty five. Fifty and Joe has C at twenty five fifty. And let's say that in the accident, Joe's injuries are fifty thousand dollars. Bob, when, so Joe, so remember, Bob crashed into Joe causing $50,000. The first thing that will happen is Bob's per person will pay out to Joe. So you're, he's going to get $25,000 from Bob's policy, and then he is left over with another $25,000. Now, initially, Joe looks at this and goes, great. I've got exactly 25 of under, underinsured motorists. I'm gonna call my insurance company and get that limit. But, ah, here's where it sucks. His insurance company is gonna say, so he's gonna call him and he's gonna say, hi, I was in an accident. They're gonna say, okay, Joe, um, you are injured at, uh, they're gonna say, okay, Joe, your limit is 25 for underinsured motorists. We're gonna subtract what Bob gave you out of your limit and you can have what's left over. 
which in this case would be nothing. In underinsured motorist, they subtract what you got from the other guy out of your limit. And you can only have what's left over, if any. In this example, the only way Bob would have gotten covered as if his Part C was at 50, 100. Because if it was at 50, they would subtract 25. He would have another 25 available. So under underinsured, they subtract what you got from the other guy and only give you what's left over, if any. So it's not very nice. But the reason they do this is because in order, um, when you pick your insurance, you have part A and you have part B, you have part C. Your part C can equal part A, but it can't ever be more than part A. So your part A can be bigger or equal to your part C, but your part C either has to be equal to or less than your A. You can't, basically what I'm saying is you cannot have more coverage for yourself than you do the other guy. You cannot have more coverage for yourself than you do the other guy. So your C can be as high as your A, but it cannot be bigger than your A. So if you want a high part C, you have to get a high part A. And a high part A is better coverage for everybody. Because like your insurance, you're 25, you know, this is something you need to think about if you're selling insurance to the people. 25, 50, 25 is not enough. It may be the state limit, but it's not enough. If you're in an accident with someone and you paralyze them, you think 25 is enough? No. So you're always going to want to encourage your people to have a big part A. Tell them to maximize their benefits. Max your policy out. Don't go for the state limit. That's not enough maximize your coverage, maximize your benefits. Use language that entices them to want to buy more because the more coverage they have, the more we're all covered, right? If you sell insurance to someone and you sold them the state minimum and they crash into you and your bill is way big, you're going to be mad. Sell them more insurance, boost up their coverage. We all know medical bills are big. So you might as well have big limits for those big medical bills so that you're protected. Because if you only have, in this case, Joe can actually sue Bob. He can. He can say, you know what, Bob? You, you injured me at 50. You only gave me 25. I'm going to sue you for the rest. And he can. Now, he may or may not get it, depending on the situation, but he can sue him. And if Bob does have that money, a judge can award it to Joe. And even if Bob doesn't have that money, a judge can, can stipend he could take money. What's the word? I forget the word. He can take money out of your paycheck. Every month, a judge can do that. So by having bigger limits, you protect yourself from being sued and having your income. There's a word for it. <laughs> Not stipend. Stipend is getting money, but they can, they garnish. They can garnish your wages. So if Bob, if Joe sues Bob in, in a court, says, Bob, you need to pay Joe the other 25. And he's like, I don't have it. A judge will say, okay, well, we're going to take a hundred dollars from your paycheck until it pays off Joe. So they can garnish your wages like that. So the bigger your insurance is, the less likely you are to have your gar wages garnished. So by having a big part C, it protects you. And it also makes you have a bigger part A, which protects everyone else. So the more coverage you have, the more everyone's protected. Okay, all right, now let's talk about part D. So part D is damage to your auto. Damage to your auto. And this is gonna be collision and other than collision. Also known as comprehensive. Okay, so collision is gonna be anytime you hit something. You hit another car, collision. You hit a tree, collision. You hit a guardrail, collision. You hit a building, collision. You hit a stop sign, collision. Every time you hit something, it's collision. Unless, unless there's an exception, unless the thing you hit is an animal. So if you hit an animal, uh -uh, an animal, we're gonna put a little asterisk here. Animal.
animals, um, if you hit an animal, that would actually be other than collision. The reason for this is because we kind of see collision is at fault. You were behind the wheel, you had control. We see other than collision as more like not at fault, uh, mother nature. It's not really your fault, not something you can control. So other than collision would be animal. If you hit an animal, it could be flood. It could be vandalism. It could be theft um, or hurricane, whatever, like mother nature type of stuff or things that you can't control like theft or vandalism. So anything out of your control would be other than collision. Now, when I say theft, I mean theft of the entire car. There is no theft of personal property. So if you have a cell phone in the car or you have a book bag in the car with a laptop in it and it gets stolen, you need homeowners for that. You cannot use um, coverage uh, D for that. It, it, coverage D only covers the actual car itself. It doesn't cover um, the stuff inside the car. Very rarely will they cover things like um, baby seats. <laughs> what are those? Car seats, car seats, baby seats, car seats. Sometimes they will cover those, but um, generally speaking, they do not cover personal property in the car. So anything stolen out of the car needs to be covered under your homeowners or renters or um, something like that. Okay, couple more things about auto. When you have a car, and remember part A, B, C, and D are all actual coverages. E and F is just duties after loss and general provision. So nothing really to write about there. When you have a car and it has coverages A, B, C, D on it, and then you attach a trailer to the car. So this is a trailer. The trailer will automatically take coverages A, B, and C. So whether this trailer is added to your insurance or not, the moment you hitch it to your car, the trailer is covered for A, B, and C, just not D, because D is damaged to your auto. So if you do want coverage for the trailer, if the trailer gets damaged and you want money to fix it, you would have to add to your auto, auto policy, add to your auto policy. You'd have to add it to your policy. But if you don't, if it's not your trailer and you don't want to add it, or you don't care if it gets damaged, you don't need to add it. It will automatically take coverages A, B, and C. Okay. Basically all the liability medical bills, but it won't take property, it won't take physical damage. You'd have to add it to the policy to get physical damage. So if you want. If you want coverage D, you would need to add it to the policy. But if you don't add it, that's fine. You still get A, B, and C. So coverage A will extend to the trailer. Coverage B will extend to the trailer. Coverage C will extend to the trailer, but D will not extend to the trailer. <clears throat> Another thing, a um, couple of uh, different coverages, you have T and E, which is towing. Um, towing, I, I forget the, what the E stands for, but um, if, if you have towing and breakdown um, coverage, that's usually going to be $25 per breakdown. They usually like to ask about that. And then the other coverage that you have is um, what, oh, travel, um, re, uh, what do we call it? If your car is stolen, <laughs> addition, I forget the name of it, but, but additional money if you're um, not quite rental reimbursement. But um, if your car is um, in uh, stolen or broken or something like that, you can get money for traveling expenses and you can get up to $20 a day for up to 600 max. So this, so $20 a day for a bus fare, for a Lyft ride, because if your car is broken down, so your car is broken down and you have rental or not, it's not rental reimbursement, but you have um, expenses for your auto, they can give you up to $20 a day, up to 600 max are typically the limits. So you want to double check. Now, if your car is broken, you have to wait 24 hours 
for you to get your $20. If your car is stolen, you have to wait 48 hours to start collecting your $20. So this could be a potential test question. They'll say, let me show you, let me draw it on a timeline so it makes sense. This is the day that your car broke down. And they'll say, your car broke down seven days ago. How much um, money did you get from your reimbursement? Whatever that coverage is called, which I cannot forget. <laughs> How much money will you get for your transportation? I think that is transportation expenses. That's what it is. That's why I'm so confused. There's breakdown, which is $25 per breakdown if you buy that coverage. Transportation expenses. That's why I'm so confused. Transportation expenses is a $20 a day up to 600 max. And, but if it's broken, you have to wait 24 hours. So broken, crashed into, destroyed, whatever. Stolen is it's been completely gone. If they say your car broke down seven days ago, how much money, and then, and then you picked it up, how much money did you get under T&E? Well, you'd have to break it down. Day one, day two. Day one doesn't get any coverage. So you'd have to go... Um, seven days minus 24 hours, which would be six days, six times 20, whatever that, whatever that is. You'd only get six days because you, you have to subtract 24 hours if it's broken. If it's stolen, you have to subtract 48 hours. So they say your car was stolen seven days ago before you got it back. You have to say like seven days minus two days, because 40 hours is two days, you'd only get five days of payments. You have to make sure you add in the 24 hours for breakdown or the 48 hours for stolen in order to um, do, do the math on that. Okay. Right at our five o'clock, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else with auto. The one, one of the things too is, um, Newly acquired, if they ask about this, newly acquired. Okay, if your car is added to your insurance, if you call and you add a car, that is a covered auto. Newly acquired is that you bought it, but you have not called, no phone call yet. Newly acquired means the insurance doesn't know about it. They don't know about it yet but it will automatically be covered if it fits the definition of personal auto, which would be that it is a personal car, not a big U-Haul truck, and that it is less than, less than 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight. Now, here's where they might trick you. When they say 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight, that means the weight of the car, the weight of the people, the weight of the cargo, the weight of the fluid, everything added all together of the car, including what you put into it and how much you carry into it is gross vehicle weight. Now they're going to say something like you have a two ton pickup and 6,000 pounds of cargo. Would this be qualified under newly acquired? The answer is no, no, because let's talk about this. A ton equals 2,000 pounds. Let me redraw that. A ton is 2,000 pounds. That's literally what a ton means. One ton is 2,000 pounds. So if you have two ton, that means that you have a 4,000 pound pickup. And 6,000 pounds of cargo means you have 10,000 pounds. And this says less than 10,000. You literally would need 9,999 for it to be covered. So you do need to know what a ton is. A ton is 2,000. Because they may say you have a one-ton pickup, a two-ton pickup, a three-ton pickup. And you need to know that a ton is 2,000. And that if they, and if it adds up to more than 10, it doesn't fit. It needs to be less than 10 in order to be covered under newly acquired. Because you automatically, if you, if you get another car, whether it's brand new, a junker car, 
your dad gave it to you, whatever, it will automatically be covered as long as it fits in the definition of a personal auto under 10,000 pounds. And, and it will be automatically covered for 14 days. That's another potential test question, 14 days. It'll also get four days of liability too. So if, if, um, if, you're, if your auto insurance has, doesn't have any comp and collision and you get another car, you have four days of life, uh, four, I'm sorry, four days of, of um, comp and collision too. Okay. So that's a newly acquired focusing on the 10,000, less, less than 10,000 pounds and knowing what a ton is. Um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, recording. Again, you can always email me if you want any of the notes. And then you can also email me your score sheet. So if you've already failed the exam and you need help to know what to study, what you need to know, email me your um, score sheet. And then don't hesitate to reach out and just ask me little questions. Um, you can email me or message me on Facebook or what's up, which is all available on my um, Facebook page. And every, I'm Nate and, and watch my YouTube and um, everywhere my name is Insurance Exam Queen. So you can find me there. Um, I'm grateful for you and um, for purchasing this. And again, reach out if you need anything. Y'all have a wonderful day.